Hello and a very warm welcome to the 29th Munich Lectures in Economics and the Annual Center for Economic Studies Distinguished CES Fellow Award. My name is Marcus John Henry Brown and I will be guiding you through today's event, an event full of laudation, lecture, and of course a Q&A where you, the audience, will be able to ask your questions simply by using the Slido link that you should now be able to see on your screens. But a, a little bit more about the Q&As later on. We're delighted to be here today to celebrate the thinking and the work of this year's recipient of the Distinguished CES Fellow Award, Professor Claudia Golden. Today, Claudia joins a long list of names who have been honoured with the title of Distinguished CES Fellow. Jean Tirol, Paul Krugman, Peter Diamond, Oliver Hart, Bengt Holstrom and Esther Duffler. An impressive list with no less than six Distinguished CES Fellows who have gone on to win a Nobel Prize in their respective fields. Now, CES and CES EFO have curated a wonderful event for you today, and it is with great happiness that I hand over now to Clemens. So here with his welcoming address is the president of the EFO Institute and the director of the Center for Economic Studies. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the 2022 Munich Lectures in Economics. My name is Clemens Fuß. I'm the director of CES and of CES IFO. Our distinguished CES fellow and Munich lecturer this year is Professor Claudia Goldin. She is the Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard University. We are delighted, Claudia, that you accepted the prize and, of course, that you accepted to deliver the Munich Lectures in Economics this year. A very warm welcome also to Professor Claudia Olivetti, who will deliver the laudation tonight. At this point, I normally say, welcome to Munich, and people make some noise. And now we are used to pressing the applaud button on our laptops. What are the Munich Lectures? The Munich Lectures were founded by our colleague and friend Hans-Werner Sinn, who also founded CES. Every year, the CES Council selects one of the world's leading scholars to be awarded the CES Distinguished Fellowship and to be invited to deliver the Munich Lectures. Uh, Claudia, you are the 29th Distinguished CES Fellow. The Munich Lectures honor an outstanding economist whose research is not only academically excellent, but also policy relevant and whose work helps us to understand the real world. This certainly applies to Claudia Goldin's work. It deals with some of the most important social and economic issues of our time. These include gender equality, technological change, education and immigration. Recently, Another laudator said about her that she is one of the most influential and insightful American economics, economists working in the world today. Exactly why Claudia Goldin is so outstanding both as a researcher and in her work will be explained to us later by Claudia Olivetti in her laudation. Let me brief you, briefly introduce Claudia Olivetti to you, although I'm sure many of you know her. Claudia is George J. Records, 1956, Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. Her research focuses on labor economics with a special focus on women in the labor market, intergenerational mobility and marriage institutions. She is linked to Claudia Goldin in various ways. Uh, first of all, they have co-authored various papers. Uh, second, uh, Claudia Goldin and Claudia Olivetti are co-directors of the NBR's Gender in the Economy study group. After the lecture, there will be a Q&A session, which will be chaired by Davide Cantoni. 
Davide is Professor of Economics and Economic History uh, here at the Department of Economics at the University of Munich and I am very grateful indeed to him because without his excellent contributions the Munich lectures would not be as enjoyable and as inspiring as they are. Uh, last but by no means least I would like to thank our partner Munich Re uh, for sponsoring this event. Munich Re has supported this lecture for many years and continued its support when the lecture was shifted online. We are very grateful for this cooperation. Thank you very much uh, and in it enjoy the laudation, the lecture and the discussion. Thank you Clemens. It's time now, as Clemens just mentioned, for today's laudation, and we're honored to be joined by Professor Claudia Olivetti, who is the George J. Records 1956 Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. Thanks, Marcus, for the great introduction. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Claudia Goldin, who will give the Munich lecture today. The importance and extent of Goldin's contributions to the field of economics is unquestionable, and it is hard to fully do justice to it in this short speech. I will try. As an innovative labor economist and economic historian, her groundbreaking contribution to a wide range of topics, unemployment, earnings inequality, immigration restrictions, education, and of course, women in the workforce, have placed her among the most influential and insightful economists in the world today. As recognized by the many awards she received, including the BBVA Frontiers in Knowledge Awards in 2019. But her legacy in the field of economics goes well beyond her groundbreaking work. As a long-term director of the NBR Group on the Development of the American Economy, she shaped the field of modern economic history, attracting to it some of the best and most interesting young economists today. Like a five-star Michelin chef, she chose her ingredient carefully and made something that was innovative and larger than its parts. She brought together researchers with diverse interests, coming from different walks of life and working with different methodologies, and created an exciting place of intellectual inquiry, full of scholars who, like her, delight in the process of discovery and believe that looking to the past is key to better understanding the present. As the president of the American Economic Association, she fostered a number of initiatives to make the economic job market more efficient and the field of economic more inclusive. Perhaps less widely known is her extraordinary mentoring. As the first female economist to be offered or obtain tenure, not one, but three Ivy League universities, the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard University, and Princeton University, Goldin has been an inspiration to many other women, readily and generously sharing her own experiences while simultaneously demonstrating the possibility of success with her stellar record achieved with integrity never-ending curiosity and commitment to the process of discovery, of discovery and passion for teaching, which she sees as complementary to research and not detracting from it. The measure of success of her mentoring method is in the long list of economies she has influenced in her own fields and more generally in the economic profession. Her students, first and foremost, and other researchers who, like me, had the great fortune to meet her early in their careers. For her research and mentoring contribution, she was awarded the Carolyn Belch Award from the CSWEP, the Committee for the Status of Women in the Economic Profession at the AEA in 2005. In her lecture, Professor Golding will bring us on a journey through the lives of five generations of US college women. Her own academic journey started at the Bronx High School of Science, where she studied bacteriology. 
In a short biographical note that she wrote in the late 1990s, and that frankly changed the trajectory of my work and my career before I even met her, she mentioned that what was driving her at that time was just passion about the study of bacteriology, not fame. And, and I quote, it was the thrill of discovery. Truth were hidden under the microscope and I was gonna find them. Fortunately for economics and to the detriment of microbiology, in her second year at Cornell University, she met the great Fred Kahn, who attracted her to the possibility of finding this hidden truth in economics. She then entered graduate work at the University of Chicago because she wanted to continue her study in, in industrial organization that she had started at Cornell. But luckily for our field, my field, she there met Gary Becker in the second year of her PhD and Robert Fogel, whose teaching she absorbed and ran with it. Throughout her career, she has made groundbreaking contribution at the boundary between economic history, labor economics, and education, likening herself to a detective sleuthing for clues and leaving no stones unturned Armed with economic theory, she masterly combined archival work and careful data analysis to offer new insight in a variety of fields, including quantitative macroeconomics. From the prairies to the textile floor to the boardrooms, she has contributed and significantly advanced a differentiated view of economic agents, emphasizing that the distinction between male and female participant in the economy is key for the better understanding of you know, long run trend and emphasizing how technological progress greatly influenced economic development and human capital accumulation and eventually the role of women in the economy. In 1990, Golding published her seminal book, Understanding the Gender Gap, an Economic History of American Women. The book combined an innovative historical work, insight from economic theories of wage determination, employment, and discrimination to trace out the economic history of American women. After almost 30 years, this book is still an essential source of material for students and scholars in this area of research and has shaped much of the current work on women in the labor market. The, may, the many deep intuition in her body of work have inspired much follow-up research, and we're still trying to catch up to all of those insights many years later. For example, Golden showed that increasing education and the emergence of a white collar sector where women had a comparative advantage were key factors in fostering the played employment of married women. She also traced back the origin of wage discrimination to the common use of promotion and job ladders as incentive mechanism in the expanding clerical set sector. This was in contrast to the piece rate pay schemes prevalent among female operatives in the manufacturing sector at the turn of the 20th century. She highlighted political economy issues in the way unions historically use the, the health of women and, chi and children to improve the working hours of the main constituencies, main workers, male workers. Overall, B Golding's body of work concerns the origin of policies issue of great current relevance. Her study of the history of education, technology, and the wage structure is connected to one of the main policy issues of our day such as rising inequality and the diverging trajectories of low and high skilled workers and, her, and their families. Her work on the role of women highlights how combining career and family would involve a more organic approach where policies such as paid leave and childcare are important, but in a context of rethinking of the production processes at home and on the market, to decrease the price of flexibility for women and to allow families not to leave money on the table. 
In a short autobiographical piece, The Economist as a Detective, which should be required reading for graduate students, Claudia wrote, I must frequently when I'll write a more popular version of understanding the gender gap, her book from 1990. I wish I had time to do it. I should, but I'm happiest being a detective. To write a popular version of a book I've already written would be like writing a textbook. There isn't much discovery involved. Well, her more recent book is actually much more than a popular version of understanding, and it involved a great amount of discovery and detective work. It is a tour de force where Cla Claudia goes well below the surface to offer an insightful and nuanced fresco of the life of generation of US women as they face the challenges associated with the often frustrated twin goals of career and family. I'm very much looking forward to her lecture on this today. Thank you, Professor Olivetti, and we'll be hearing more from Claudia later on in the Q&A. But it's time now to hand back to Clemens for the formal presentation, albeit virtually, of this Distinguished CES Fellow Award 2022. OK, thank you, Marcus. And now comes a joyous but rather formal part of the ceremony. Uh, and I will read this text to you. Uh, the Center for Economic Studies of LMU Munich is happy to award to Claudia Goldin this year's prize as Distinguished CES Fellow and nominates her to give the Munich Lectures in Economics 2022. Congratulations, Professor Goldin. It's time now for the Munich Lecture. And a quick reminder that you can post questions at any time during the lecture by using the Slido link that you can now see on your screens. Claudia Golden is the Henry Lee Professor at Harvard University, uh, co-director MBER, Gender and the Economy Study Group Research Associate, NBER, and Research Fellow IZA. This year alone, she has been awarded the Cabot Prize Fellowship and the Richard A. Lester Prize and the Visionary Award from the Council for Economic Education. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Econometric Society. Here with her 2022 Munich Lecture is the Distinguished CES Fellow, Professor Claudia Golden. Okay, I'm delighted to be here today to talk about career and family then and now. My talk is going to traverse 120 years, beginning when college graduate women were able to have either a family or a career, and ending now when many anticipate having both a family and a career. And as we have moved into an era, a hybrid era, that I'm going to call ACDC because it's after COVID, but still during COVID. We may be on the cusp of real change in the workplace and in caregiving. And I'm going to take you on this journey from then to now. And the journey is going to wind up when far more women than men are graduating college in just about every rich country in the world about the same fraction are achieving advanced and professional degrees. When there is great similarity in ambitions between men and women, but when there is less in eventual achievement. And the reason for that concerns the concept of greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity or between gender equality and couple equity. These are two sides of the same issue for different sex couples. Now, same sex couples can have couple inequity, but they don't give rise to gender inequality. When different sex couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality. I shall 
explain. A few clarifications to begin with. First of all, my work concerns college graduate women because they have had the greatest opportunity to achieve career even when their numbers have been quite low. And the second point is that when I use the word career, I mean something very different from a job. A career is achieved over time. It comes from the Latin root to mean to run a race. Think about carriages and chariots. A job is a spot position to earn a living. Aspirations and achievements of college graduate women across the past 120 years greatly changed. The reasons for the changes vary with the period. Early on in this history, the labor market shifted its demands from brawn work to brain work, and that favored women. But more recently, wide-ranging technological changes have expanded economic inequality and increased returns to hours intensive jobs. And these have widened the gap in gender earnings. These technological changes are somewhat universal. There have also been more local technological changes, those that have greatly impacted the home, such as early on the spread of electricity and clean water and sewerage systems requiring public infrastructure. And much later in this history, greater and improved fertility control has enabled women to delay marriage, to delay childbearing, but more recently has also enabled women to have children at older ages. Thus, technological changes in this story of many, they're universal, they're local, and they're personal. The college graduate women in this story group in five distinct birth cohorts that form what I call a succession of generations across the 120 years, each metaphorically passing a baton from one to the next, a baton that has warnings and advice. But even though there have been gains across these groups, the way work is currently structured and the persistence of social norms, no matter how much weaker they become, mean a lower ability for women to attain both career and family. The five groups are as follows. The first, and this is for the US, graduated college from 1900 to 1919, and they achieved family or career. And the next group had a job and then a family. And the third group, which in the US, so the mother, the baby boom, graduated college from 1946 to 1965. They had a family first and then a job. And the fourth group, which happens to be mine, was the first to desire a career and then a family. The fifth, graduating since the 1980s, desires a career and a family and has succeeded more than any other. And by the way, the end years that I give for that cohort is only because I need to track them to when they're in their 40s. The 120 year period is a transition from career or family to career and family. And here is bookended with women who served in the US Congress, beginning with Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to federal office in the US. And she was typical of the career portion of her cohort. She never married, she had no kids. She just had one amazing career. Her story is very interesting. At the other extreme is Tammy Duckworth, the senator from the state of Illinois in the US and the first US senator to have a baby while holding office and the first to bring a baby into an active session of US Congress, even though many would say that there have always been babies in the US Congress. She is an extraordinary member of Group 5. Betty Friedan, the author, looking rather coquettish, 
is in the middle. I'm going to provide a bit more detail on each of these five groups. And I'm going to tell you about the fraction that never married by age 30, by age 50, the fraction who didn't have children by age 45, and the fraction who worked if they were ever married when they were young and when they were older. College graduate women first achieved family or career, as I said. Few in this group manage both. And as you can see here, 50% in this group one never had a birth. 32% would never marry. And just a small fraction were in the labor force, if ever married. In group two, more college women aspired to have careers, but that didn't happen for a large number of reasons. In group three, as job opportunities improved, and as America in post-World War II era was swept up in early marriages and an enormously large baby boom, college women shifted to planning for family and then a job. Note that just 9% of this group never married, 18% never had a birth. Of those who ever married, it was under 10% who didn't have uh, children. Their employment rates were low, not surprisingly when they were young, but they increased enormously to 73% when the kids were older. This was enormously progressive change since this group found a way to have both a job and a family and occasionally a career in a family. They trained to be teachers and nurses and social workers and librarians after the kids were grown. Career then family became the goal for many in group four, and they delayed marriage and children for a career and had high work rates when young. For group four, the birth control pill and its dissemination to young single women enabled the delay of marriage and the delay of family and help boost their investments in education, professional degrees, and eventually in a career. But as you can see, the bi biological clock ran out on many, and 27% never had children. As this iconic Roy Lichtenstein print, I can't believe it, I forgot to have the children, reminds us. For group five, the goal is both career and family, and just 21% didn't have children by their 40s. Marriage and family for group five are still greatly delayed, in fact, even more delayed than for group four. But birth rates have been up before the pandemic, partly due to assisted reproductive technologies. Here is the more complete series on zero births. On the horizontal axis is the birth year of the mother, and on the vertical axis is the fraction who never had births as of the age that is given. So you can see the large differences across these groups. Focus on the bottom line, 40 to 44. Note that for group one, as I said, 50% never had a birth by that age. And then that fraction goes way down to about below 18% for group three. Then it goes up for group four to the 27% number I mentioned, and then down again for group five. The group divisions that I gave you before now appear more meaningful. And you can see one of the many indicators that I've used to form these groups. But you may be thinking that because of the large increase in college graduation, that much of the difference across the groups is due to selection. Who went to college? The rich from particular families. But the surprising finding, particularly in the US, is that selection into college 
with regard to these outcomes is not important at all. The elite changed along with the ordinary folk. So the elite would have had low birth rates for group one, and they had very high birth rates for group three. Important accompaniments to the transition across the groups were changes in customs and norms. The General Social Survey has for some time asked respondents whether they believed that preschool children would likely suffer if their mothers worked. And the answers are graphed here. The horizontal axis is the birth year of the respondent, and the vertical axis is the fraction that agreed with the statement preschool children are likely to suffer if their mother works. And as can be seen, agreement decreased with birth year and over time for both men and women. Without much new evidence, the response changed. Fewer agreed with the notion that preschool children would be harmed if their mother worked. The older norm disappeared in part because it became more expensive to sustain as the earnings of women rose. But how have the actual achievements of career and family changed across the groups? To compute this, one needs at least two definitions, one for family and one for career. I will define family very simply as having a child. The child can be biological, the child can be adopted. I do not require in this definition that there necessarily be a husband or a partner present. Career is more complicated and it is achieved by exceeding a particular level of income for a certain number of years. In this case, it's given by exceeding the income for a male at the 25th percentile of the male distribution for the same education and age group. And that amount has to be exceeded in each of these five-year groups for three of the years, which follows the notion that career is something achieved over time and not in just one year. I provide these computed dual success rates for groups three, four, five, and also something I call five plus for two age groups for 35 to 39 year olds and for 50 to 54 year olds. So the bottom line is that career and family success is going to be increasing both within each group as it aged and across groups. And note here that success is success in both together, it's career and family. For group five plus, which is the group here that is born uh, in the most recent period, and I can only compute them for when they're in their late 30s, the rate for women is 28%. And you can see that for this younger group, it increases over time. That's the dark purple bar. For the older group, it also increases, but not by that much. And you can see within each cohort, it increases over time. But for group five plus, you can see that the rate for the younger group of women is about 28%, which is the highest it's been over this period. But that for men in this group, you may be wondering what that is. Once again, the dual success rate is 60%. So even though women's success rates today have greatly improved, they're still just about half that of men and of men of the same age group and the same education. Although a succession of women has made progress on the journey to career and family, women's careers still often 
take a backseat to those of their spouses. The members of the most recent group have expressed frustration and place the blame for this on a number of factors, discrimination, managerial bias, pay inequity, and sexual harassment on the job. But how has that changed over time? To measure the level of discontent, I have used counts of phrases in the New York Times. These are counts of phrases of either gender discrimination or sex discrimination and then normed by essentially the size of the newspaper. So what you can see is that there are two big waves. The first in the 1970s, and that is the group, the noisy revolution of 50 years ago. And the next one in the more recent period, the 2010s, which is the Me Too movement. But as each group progressed and passed this baton from one cohort to the next, and as actual barriers fell and social norms changed, the real underlying problem was revealed. There's no question that there is some classic discrimination and bad actors and bias workers and discriminatory supervisors, but most of the difference in earnings is due to something else. The new problem with no name to paraphrase Betty Friedan is the notion of greedy work. Working more hours or particular hours leads to greater rewards even on an hourly basis. In upper out jobs, such as academia, more effort today increases the probability of a promotion later. But to have a family takes the time of at least one parent. There's no way to entirely contract that out. For a couple to share the joys of children equally is costly. Let me illustrate. In this case, and the horizontal axis is hours and the vertical axis is earnings, one job is flexible. That's the red line. It has a linear wage with respect to hours. The other job, the blue line, is not so flexible. And it has a wage or a slope that rises with hours. A couple with children could, cannot both work at the blue dot at the less flexible job. If they did, the children would perish. But they could both work at the red dot. But note that if they did, they would be leaving a lot of money on the table, that amount in the brackets. So one works at the flexible job, the less remunerative red job, and the other works at the less flexible, more remunerative blue job. And how does that work? For many highly educated couples with children, she's the professional who's also on call at home. And he's the professional who is also on call on the job. In consequence, he earns a lot more than she does. And this gives rise to a gender gap in earnings. And it also produces couple inequity. If the flexible job could be made more productive, the difference would be less and family equity would be cheaper. Couples could purchase it. And that amount now, as you can see in the brackets, is much smaller. Couples could purchase it since it's now a lot cheaper and they would also reduce the gender gap if they both worked at the red dot. Note that even for same-sex couples, there could still be couple inequity, but it wouldn't add to gender inequality. And even if a couple desperately wanted a 50-50 relationship, and many do, 
high earnings for the position with less controllable hours would entice them to specialize. They'd both have jobs, but one would have the less remunerative, flexible position, and the other would have the higher paying, less remunerative, flexible. One would have the less remunerative, flexible position. The other would have the higher paying, more demanding position. The point is that the gender gap in earnings is a symptom of career blockage. It is not the cause. The cause of career blockage is the high price of couple equity. Now, everybody wants solutions. What are the solutions? Knowing the problem is always the first step to finding a solution. Once you know the problem, and I think I have set forth what the problem is, there are three general solutions. The first would involve lowering the cost of flexibility, the amenity on the job. Another would involve reducing the cost of childcare and elder care. Thus, the first two would involve changing relative prices. And the third solution would alter gender norms, but that's far more difficult. Let's take a deeper look at the first solution. How does one lower the price of flexibility? The simplest way is to create good substitutes for workers. If you had just one perfect substitute, you would never need to work the hours when you would need it for caregiving. Well, how could that be done? Wouldn't that be nice? Well, IT could be used to pass information and hand off clients without loss of information and with little loss of fidelity. Teams of substitutes could be created as they have been in fields like pediatrics and anesthesiology and veterinary medicine, personal banking, many, many tech jobs and primary care doctors. Teams of complements, as is often the case in consulting, actually increase the cost of coordinating schedules. The tale that I have told was said in the years, what I called BCE, before the COVID era. What does it tell us about the new era today? In mid-March of 2020, we descended into the DC or during COVID world. Those who could sheltered in place and worked from home and fortunate children had online schooling and at-home help. Parental childcare time just about doubled. In the age of ACDC, schools are open now. Childcare time is still somewhat higher than before. One edge of the silver lining to the dark times that we have all lived through is that in the US, we began a national dialogue about caregiving. We once long ago had this conversation in 1943, when in the US we desperately needed non-working mothers to help out on the home front to win the war. We created subsidized preschools open from early morning to evening, and we extended public school hours. We then abandoned these policies after the war because women were not that important to the economy. Women are now half the labor force just about. We learned in the pandemic that much of the economy runs on women. Another edge to the silver lining is that we have learned to use technology to work from home. And as long as working from home does not become a female enclave, it will serve to lower the cost of flexibility. We always had flexible jobs, but they were costly. If one doesn't have to go to Tokyo to do that m and if one doesn't have to go to Zurich to sign that contract, 
then parents, especially women, will be able to take these positions that were generally considered to be less flexible. So another part of the solution is to reduce travel, meaning both ordinary commuting and business travel, and enable work from home, but don't create a work from home ghetto and don't make it work from hell either. Make the amenity less expensive by making flexible work more productive. So the story that I have told for the BCE world is really what we need for the ACDC world. Prior to March of 2020, in this time that I called BCE, the reasons women were being held back from achieving career and family became clearer and clouds parted allowing us to see what was blocking the way. And what was blocking their way was greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity or between gender equality and couple equity. They are the two sides of the same issue. When couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality. So thank you very much, and the journey continues. Thank you so much, Professor Golden. Well, as you can see, Clemens has moved back to his soundproofed room to take part in the Q&A. Davide Cantoni from the LMU will be moderating the next session, and we're looking forward to all of your questions. Now, I'm sure you have them, and as I've been mentioning throughout uh, today's event, you should use the Slido link uh, that you can now see on your screen to post them. So let's start with the Q&A. Over to you, Davide. Well, thank you, Marcus, for handing over, and thanks especially to Claudia for his wonderful and inspiring lecture, as Claudia, the other Claudia Olivetti, said before. Uh, we're still trying to catch up, as you said before, with, with all the literature that you've provided us and with all your thoughts that you've provided us over your, your whole career. So um, I now, you know, let me invite you again, as Marcus did before, to post your questions online. Um, what would also be lovely if when you post your questions online, you also put your name. I see it's optional, but of course, I'd be very pleased to relate your name to Claudia when I read out the question. Um, so while, you know, I'm waiting for questions to come up, uh, you know, let me thank you again. And, you know, let me also say how much I think we all can identify. I mean, first of all, we can, I think, all identify with your wonderful concept of greedy work. And it's certainly something that we all feel in our lives. And, you know, I also like also your partition uh, of this historical experience into different generations. I think we all have, have stories and we can all identify with the stories maybe of our mothers, of our grandmothers, um, and, you know, of our spouses or of ourselves on how to uh, juggle um, in this difficult situation. So um, here the first questions are coming, coming in. So there's a question by Anonymous. So let me remind you again that it would be lovely if you put your name. Um, so Anonymous is asking, if the developments of gender and career and family norms are specific to the US or whether the developments are comparable in other developed countries. And the answer is going to be that it's not entirely specific to the US at, at all. Uh, one of the things that is specific to the US is that because college education was much higher in the US, I can take cohorts going further back, but college has certainly caught up to the US and the rest of the world. And so it's, it's not specific at all. I mean, one of the things that's, that I find interesting is what's happening in places like Korea, Japan, and, and China, where in some sense, uh, women uh, are sort of reliving, <clears throat> educated women are reliving what happened to 
cohort one, remember, which was the career or family. And there are uh, a sense that there are gold misses and leftover women in China or Korea and, and Japan who are highly educated, who want careers, and in some sense, the norms of countries haven't caught up with that. So, uh, so there are things that are uh, the same across many countries, and there are things that are fascinating and different. So there's a question by another Claudia, actually, one of your former Cambridge Mass colleagues, Claudia Steinwender. She's asking, as I'm trying to entertain my son while I'm listening to your lecture, I'm wondering about how to think about, uh, how to think about the academics profession, how, how greedy is science, and I guess in particular compared to, to other professions. So, so academics is a, a, a obviously an interesting profession for us because we're in it, but it's also a profession in which we do have a lot of ability to arrange our lives every day, but we're under tremendous pressure. So the greediness of the job is very different from the greediness of jobs in which someone is asked at three in the morning to make a PowerPoint presentation for someone. So it's, it's that what you do now is going to have payoffs in the future. And so you're, in some sense, you're, you're bundling a set of years that you're giving. So the greediness isn't, in some sense, per hour. It's more over a period of time. So it's, it's, there are uh, many different upper out jobs, such as in uh, law making partners. Um, but one other thing that I want to throw out, which is ex incredibly important, is that um, much of the changes over the past, let's say, 10 years in many professions have been very harmful to women in particular because the greediness means that there are many years that people are spending to get to, to jockey, to get to this important position and it means that you eventually make tenure or make your first promotion or become partner when you're in your mid-30s. And that's a late moment for women to suddenly breathe out and say, I can have the kids now. So when I went to graduate school, we went right after we got our BAs. We spent four years we got assistant professor positions. We were up for tenure in five or six years. Now we've added two years at the beginning because people do pre-docs, maybe even three years post-docs. And then at the end, uh, tenure, and first of all, getting your PhD is no longer four years. It's more like six years. So you can see that the number of years that we're adding is enormously large and in some sense, very disruptive, particularly for women. Can I, can I throw in a question here, uh, also related to academia, Davide? Uh, Claudia, I, I've, what I found very interesting was your point about uh, the composition of teams. Uh, see that there is more substitutability within teams. Uh, that makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, uh, but I was just wondering in academia, if I mean, we organize academia, research organizations, research institutes. Uh, is there a chance to do that in academia or is academia an area where it's difficult? How, how, how would you? Should well, we the, uh, the, no, there are a lot of areas where you can have, remember the, the word team uh, has two different meanings. There are teams of substitutes and there are teams of complements. And they're going to have very different effects on this equilibrium. So what is needed here are substitutes. Complements are the most corrosive because if you have complements, then everyone has to coordinate on a time. And that means that you'll never be able to include the people who have 
the responsibilities at home, okay? And so teams of substitutes are extremely good. And so you might have uh, teaching teams. And so if someone can't do a lecture on a particular day, you can call on someone else to do it who's a very good substitute. Obviously not a perfect substitute, but a very, very good substitute. You might have teams in doing committee work. In fact, Claudia Olivetti and I uh, team up on a committee that, you know, uh, as was noted in the NBR, and sometimes I have more time, sometimes she has more time. And we're pretty good substitutes because we know each other way very well, we convey information. And it's that type of substitutability that is going to solve this problem, not teams of compliments, which is, of course, the way we often do research. So there are a couple of questions on, um, I would say, policy. And so, you know, the, the general question posed by Nadia Dwenger is, in your opinion, what do you think is the role of government and public policy in this process? And, you know, there's also a more specific answer, a question that I would just want to read at the same time uh, by Emmanuel Hansen, who's asking, do you think that the U.S. and other countries could substantially reduce couple inequity by moving from joint taxation towards separate taxation? So the answer to the latter question. A very specific question. question. So the answer to the latter question is absolutely yes. So um, I will leave it to my friends in public finance to answer that better, but it's my sense that, that the answer would be yes to that. And, and I hope that the U.S. moves in that direction at some point. It would certainly reduce my taxes, but that isn't why I'm interested in it. Uh, in terms of policy, um, what's, what's interesting to me is that the most important policies that I see, remember I said that there are policies that change relative prices. So the policies that change relative prices that for goods and services that affect at this moment in history, women more than men would be the relative price of childcare and the relative price of elder care. So to the extent that governments change these relative prices, uh, there is a very, very large role for government. Uh, the US for a very large number of complex reasons has been a late comer in changing relative prices for, uh, for the care of, of uh, very small children. So we've just gotten to the point where we're thinking about uh, universal preschool, which is four-year-olds, but we haven't made much of a dent in the minds of individuals in Congress and elsewhere to think about uh, what's going to happen to the really little ones and to subsidize that. And part of that, what's interesting is if you look at the data in the U.S., the fraction of women working who have an infant that's a zero to one. So we can track that using CPS data from about 1972 to the present and you can see that that rises from a very low number to about 60%, and then it doesn't budge from that. So if we want to ask, why is the U.S. so resistant in having policies similar to those, for example, in Sweden, a part of it is that we are a very divided nation, and that's seen in that number, that a large fraction of Americans believe thoroughly, still believe that young children should be taken care of by their mothers. And that resistant 40% that I just uh, mentioned is an indication of that. So in the US, it's, 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 it's going to be very, very difficult at the federal level. We're a large country. <laughs> and so these are policies that may have to be forged at the state level or even at the municipal level. 
If I can just follow up on that, so since you, you know, rightly say the U.S. is a very divided country, is there anything you can say about these trajectories over time and their future by areas of the U.S.? Is, is that different for more Republican or you know, traditionally more conservative parts uh, and more sure. liberal parts? So uh, prior to the pandemic, and this is some work that Claudia and I and Sari had worked on, we were thinking about what's happening to uh, to a leave policy, paid leave policy. So paid leave are policies that exist in almost every country except for the United States, and it's often thrown out as a joke that it's also Papua New Guinea <laughs> that also doesn't have such a policy. <laughs> Just to make fun of the U.S., where we're uh, compared with Papua New Guinea, which I'm sure is a lovely place. Uh, and so prior to the pandemic, uh, there were, I think it was about eight states plus the District of Columbia that themselves as a state had forged a, a state policy for paid leave, in other words, through their disability program or their UI program, they managed to pass an additional tax to fund paid leave. Uh, at, at, when we had written this, a paper on this subject, we noted that there were about 18 more states that had proposed this legislation. And uh, then we had the pandemic it turns out that I was looking at the map the other day uh, that three more states have come on board, including one that was not in the original group, and that was Colorado. Oregon has as well, uh, and, uh, and another state, um, I think Maryland, actually. But if, if I look at the map and I compare it with red states and blue states, which I haven't done, I'm not quite, I, I, I actually think that there isn't as much of a concordance there as one might think, but it's certainly the case that the early movers are more of the blue states. Okay, so speaking about, you know, red and blue states or liberal and more conservative parties, we have a question by Anastasia, who works in the private sector in Zurich, she writes, and she's a mother of a six-month-old soon to be back to 100% work, which is negatively perceived. What are your thoughts about stereotypes? And you know, maybe one thing to add is that Switzerland is, I think in, in Europe, the country where when you ask the question, are mothers, can mothers be good mothers if their children are taken care of by preschool scores um, at the bottom of the league? So maybe this is certainly in Anastasia's mind when she's thinking about considering going back to work. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations. That's very nice. And uh, you will uh, be a leader. <laughs> that's all I can uh, that's all I can say. but there there obviously are lots of problems with <laughs> with the notion of stereotypes. So she's worried she's going to go back to work and uh, in her office, and I'm not quite certain exactly uh, how things will come up, someone, might say, uh, we have a big client and we want someone, it's going to be a tough job, and someone will have some paternal sexism and say, well, don't give it to her because she has a six-month-old. So my sense is that women in the, that position have to step up and assert themselves and say, I can take these difficult positions because guess what? This six-month-old has a father, <laughs> and uh, no, no one said that my child's going to be harmed if his father takes care of him. So if I, if I may maybe abuse my, my role as moderator and, and, and drop another question of mine, um, what about part-time jobs? I think this is a, a you know, big difference, I think, between the U.S. and you know, mostly Northwestern Europe, where most women work part-time jobs when they have kids and so i think the big question is it is it a stepping stone towards a career or is it a stumbling stone putting you on a 
on a bad yeah trip. i i think the unfortunate thing is is that it's more of a stumbling stone and that what we see in the data and something that we would like to look more at is that, and we, we see it in the data for the Netherlands, for example, which has uh, an extraordinarily large fraction of its workforce, female workforce working part-time, is that when that policy in the Netherlands was first uh, formed, uh, the idea was that women could work part-time at prorated amounts, so there would be no greedy work. Uh, when they are younger and then immediately go into full-time work. And what was found uh, about 10, 15 years ago in looking at uh, longitudinal data was that for many individuals, when you work part-time, it's, it's either hard for you personally to get out of that or it's hard for the firm to figure out how to re-employ you at full-time. But once part-time, unfortunately, is part-time for a longer time. I mean, one of the interesting things about the new, what I would call and others have as well, the new world of work is the possibility that work from home will substitute for part-time work. And so you will work in the office, let's say, two or three days a week full-time and work from home another two or three days, okay? And so rather than working part-time, you will always have your foot in the door, so to speak. And will that be a solution? We don't know. I mean, this is uh, what's, what, uh, of course, is wonderful about being an economist is that the world does change and we're given, uh, we're, we're, we're given interesting issues to work with where the future is uncertain and the future right now is pretty uncertain. So there's a question by Sarah who's asking, do you think that the greediness of work or the susceptibility of employees to greediness will change in the future? Right, and, and what I ended with, thank you very much, Sarah. What I ended with is the possibility that there is this silver lining to the pandemic and that the new world of work will change the greediness of work. That's one, one way in which it would change. The other way it will change is if we get buy-in from men and buy-in from men is a very big deal. So maybe th th there's also a related question by Leander, uh, Leander Wolf, who's asking, how will group six look like? So if you think about, uh, you know, what was the progression between groups four, five, and six? What, what, what will be uh, group six like? I don't know if there is a six. That's why I called it five plus. <laughs> uh, what, what would, I'm not certain what I would call group six. Uh, you know, is there a possibility, for example, that, uh, you know, I, I talk about career and family, and is there a possibility that young people today will say, who cares about a career? I just care about having a good time. I, I, I have often said that the reason that I love being an economic historian is that I do really well predicting the past. I, make, <laughs> I do not pretend that I can predict the future. So maybe, you know, looking back at the past, there are, you know, several questions about COVID. And I think, you know, there's something that, of course, we, we all feel uh, still very, you know, like an open wound to, to the past two years. So, um, you know, one of the questions asks, in how far did COVID set us back on this trajectory towards gender equity? And thinking especially about the closure of schools and childcare being managed by mothers. Right. I, I know the data for the U.S., pretty well. And uh, so in terms of labor force participation, in terms of the fraction at work, uh, contemporaneously, it really hasn't set us back. I mean, the notion that women 
would be scarred for 10 years, that women were dropping out of the labor force in droves. It just didn't happen. I mean, the uh, COVID scarred certain groups for sure. And the less educated, uh, comma, black women, comma, Hispanic women, comma, women living and men living in uh, small apartments, uh, they were affected a lot more because the health effects were very large for various groups. The less educated were affected a lot more because they didn't have the opportunities to work at home. But for the college graduate groups in the U.S., the uh, contemporaneous effects and even for some of the lesser educated groups were much, much smaller than anyone was writing about for the year and a half after um, the pandemic began. Uh, now, what's going to happen down the pike? Remember, I said that's the contemporaneous, the contemporaneous effect was that a female labor force participation did not plummet at work numbers, did not plummet for women uh, versus men. Uh, they plummeted for the less educated men. They plummeted for the less educated women, not labor force participation uh, later on. Okay. But we worry about scarring effects. For example, there's a, there was a very, very nice piece on whether uh, in academia, we, we have this, we have a wonderful leading indicator, which is who's putting out working papers. And yes, <laughs> the people who are putting out working papers were disproportionately those without kids and disproportionately men who had kids versus women who had kids. So we don't know very much else. We don't have leading indicators in other fields that are easy to, to get one's hands on. So this could scar future generations, but the aggregate data uh, does not look that way. Well, so let me just remind the listeners, we have about five minutes to go. So if you want to bring in your question, now is the moment. Um, there's a question about, again, from an anonymous reader, uh, about externalities. And um, they are asking us, every couple that allows the husband to work full time or flexibly reduces the career prospects for couples that split, split it more equally. And so I guess the implied question is, how do we think and solve this externality? Yeah, I, there, there are uh, issues like that all over. For example, there's a great paper using Swedish data uh, where there's another type of externality, which is that the man who takes parental leave then doesn't get the promotion later on. So therefore, this, this doesn't even have women involved in it other than the fact that there is a woman who's benefiting because the man took parental leave. So, um, so that, so there, there are externalities, spillovers, whatever we want to call them, uh, that are uh, throughout this, uh, this, I think, fascinating and difficult set of issues. So um, I, I think one has to sort of step back and write out interesting models before we say exactly what we know is going on. But that's a very good question. So, um, you know, again, you, you said the important thing is to identify the problem before talking about solutions. But of course, our listeners who are tuning in want solutions. And so one of the questions by Clemens, uh, who's posting here is, long working hours can be measured to achieve power and higher position in organizations. How can this kind of mechanism be limited? Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not a, a person who would uh, be a fan of having limitations on hours because they're never going to work. <laughs> uh, so how it can be uh, eliminated is by having a substitutability, okay? So if, if I'm a firm 
and I know that I have to pay you more to work extra hours, I'm going to try to figure out how to conserve on that. And if I can figure it out with something that allows me to substitute someone for you, I'm going to do that. So just saying that an individual is going to work more hours because they want more power and prestige leaves out the fact that one of the beauties about the market system is that um, it penalizes that in the market system, there's another side that wants to conserve on what it's spending. And so it's going to try to find a way uh, of getting someone to do it for less. So there's one more question about, you know, going back, thinking about the pandemic um, and uh, about preferences of women. So Anonymous is asking, is there any general information about preferences of women to stay at home with their children during work? Home office is often preferred for this reason. So say the question again. The question is about if, if, there, if we have general information about the preferences of women to stay at home. Probably, I guess, implied question is how do we act if we know about these preferences? So the the question is whether individuals we know, <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that when we were given the green light to come back into the workplace, a very large number of people said, I'm not coming back. I really so there are there are lots of ways and lots of clever ways that economists have devised to figure out how much people would pay to stay at home. And it certainly looks as if people are willing to pay a lot to stay at home. Part of it is to conserve on commuting time. Part of it is to manage the hours themselves. Part of it is together with that is to take care of children and others. Uh, so we, we, there are lots of studies that are being done particularly for individuals who are uh, who worked in call centers, for example, and worked on site of call centers and now can work at home in call centers. So there, there are studies that have data on how much individuals are willing to pay to work at home and also whether they're more productive or less productive at home. So these are, once again, fascinating questions that the new world of work is going to hopefully offer us information so that we can answer that question better. So let me conclude with a final question. And, you know, in a way it also asks about the new world of work or how we want to design it. So um, Angela Lechner is asking, how can the rewards of flexible work be increased and the costs of childcare and elder care be reduced at the same time if this work is mainly done by women? So, so obviously one way of reducing the cost is to, what we said before, is to have it subsidized to, so that it is something that governments and, and, and the public would want it to be subsidized. And that would even things out uh, a lot. So I hope that that is part of the answer. Well, thank you again. Thanks to all the listeners who've asked questions. And thanks, Claudia. You've given us much to think about for the coming AC, DC, and hopefully PC post-COVID era. And I think I'm handing back now. So thanks again. Thanks to all the listeners. Well, thanks very much. Yes, thank you. Um, what a, a fantastic Q&A. Thank you, Davida. That was uh, magnificently moderated there. I think we can all agree. So, Clements, final thoughts, final words on uh, this evening's event? Yes, thank you, Marcus. I think what we've witnessed is really a fascinating seminar and one uh, that was about uh, things we all experience in our lives. Economists sometimes have this reputation of uh, dealing with abstract issues and things people don't understand, but I think uh, this uh, seminar uh, was completely different. It was about, uh, I suppose, experiences we all have somehow in our lives, and uh, I have to say I've learned a lot 
um, about very practical things. Now, but before we conclude, let me mention that there will be a workshop linked to this lecture uh, with Claudia Golding on the 23rd of November. It would also be an online event, so don't miss it. Many thanks to Davide and uh, Ingrid Hegeler for organizing this workshop. And thanks, of course, to Claudia for doing this as well. So let me again thank uh, Claudia Golding and Claudia Olivetti for uh, the lecture and the laudation. Thanks to Davide for moderating a great discussion and many thanks to all of you for participating. Let me also thank all those who have contributed to the organization of this year's lectures behind the scenes. Uh, the CES and CES IFO team, uh, in particular Mehmet Ayas, the CES academic coordinator and Daniel Firk for technical arrangements. Let me also express my gratitude to our sponsor, Munich Re, and um, last but by no means least, of course, a great thank you to you, Marcus, uh, to uh, thank you to Marcus John Henry Brown for leading us through this evening so brilliantly. So have a nice evening and see you again, maybe next year at the Munich lectures, but uh, hopefully much earlier. Thank you. And hopefully in real life as well. So thank you very much uh, from me. And thank you to all of you for watching. Um, hope to see you again next year, wherever you are in the world. Stay safe and stay healthy. And goodbye. <laughs>